the uh, kind introduction. Um, I too would like to thank the Tsadja Foundation and the University of Vienna, uh, Professor Mattis and um, all the other conference organizers uh, for uh, a most edifying uh, symposium. Uh, as someone who specializes in, in Japanese Buddhism, I'm a bit of an outlier um, to the, the subject matter of uh, this conference. It's been most um, edifying. Uh, so thank you all very much. Uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Kumagai um, introduced you to the concept of uh, original enlightenment. Uh, the doctrine of uh, original enlightenment uh, denotes uh, a discourse, or more properly a group of discourses, that uh, emerged in Japan from the influential Tendai school uh, during the medieval period, that's around the uh, latter 11th to the 12th century that it appears and then flourishes until roughly the 18th. Uh, in essence, Hongaku doctrine rejects the idea of enlightenment as something acquired. It asserts that Buddhahood is neither a potential to be realized nor a goal to be achieved, but the true status of all things. Ordinary deluded people do not transform and become Buddhas. We are Buddha already from the outset and have only to realize it. The radiant Buddhas with their extraordinary marks who appear in the sutras are not real Buddhas, but merely provisional signs. The real Buddha is the ordinary worldling, the Pratyajana, Bombu in Japanese, just as he or she is. Liberation depends not on such actions as moral cultivation or merit accumulation, but on the insight or even the faith that one is Buddha originally. Now, whether in praise or censure, uh, original enlightenment has thought has also often been characterized in scholarship as peculiarly, peculiarly or perhaps even aberrantly Japanese. It's been celebrated as the climax of Buddhism as philosophy, in that it pushes to the limit the implications of Mahayana non-duality. It has also been attacked as an uncritical world affirmation that in valorizing all things as enlightened just as they are, in effect denies the need for practice and legitimates evil conduct. Uh, alternatively, uh, the advocates of so-called critical Buddhism, uh, Hakamaya Noriaki and Matsumoto Shiro, who I believe we're going to hear more about this afternoon, have denounced it as a sacralizing of the status quo that endorses social inequities. Uh, I've addressed these criticisms uh, extensively elsewhere. Uh, I myself do not see Hongaku doctrine as either aberrant nor particularly Japanese. Uh, but as an extension of broader Mahayana ideas. I also argue that original enlightenment thought does not deny the need for practice, but rather reconceives it. And today I'd like to explore that reconception, showing how Hongaku, original enlightenment doctrine, reinterprets the relationship of practice and enlightenment in light of its claim that we are enlightened already. So first, let me provide some be, uh, brief background, and then I'll um, give some illustrations from a specific text, uh, the 12th century Shinyokan, or Contemplation of Suchness. Original Enlightenment doctrine draws heavily on Chinese Mahayana notions of liberation as entailing insight into the nature of the cosmos as a holistic, non-dual, interrelated realm in which all beings, being empty of fixed substance, interpenetrate and contain one another without losing their individual identity. And we can roughly identify uh, three major versions of this concept. Uh, one is the idea typically associated with the Huayan school that all phenomena emanate from an originally pure, undifferentiated one mind. Liberation lies in discerning that phenomena of the samsaric world are in essence no different from the one mind and thus originally pure. And in East Asia, by the way, the term Tathagata Garba is usually reserved for that kind of model, emphasizing uh, an original one mind. 
Um, a second model uh, coming out of the Tiantai school places greater emphasis on the phenomenal. The mind and all phenomena are always simultaneous and inseparable. No hierarchy, no before or after obtains between them. This position rules out notions of primal purity, the mutual inclusion of good and evil, delusion and enlightenment, and all sentient beings and their environments from hell dwellers to Buddhas is the true aspect of all things. Uh, this model is associated with the famous Tiantai threefold contemplation, uh, to see phenomena as empty, as nonetheless conventionally existing, and as neither one-sidedly empty nor conventionally existing, but exhibiting both aspects simultaneously. Uh, that is the middle way. And then we have a third tantric model that sees the phenomenal world as the body and mind of the omnipresent cosmic Buddha, Mahavairochana. And this model is associated with the tantric techniques of mudras, mantras, and mandalas, by which the body, speech, and mind of the practitioner are aligned, or perhaps we could say synced, uh, with the body, speech, and mind of Mahavairochana. So while differing in their emphases, all three visions of a non-dual interpenetrating universe imply an ontological equality of the Buddha and living beings and suggest a reconceptualizing of the phenomenal world, not as a realm of suffering to be escaped, but as the very realm where liberation is to be achieved. That is the premise on which medieval Japanese Tendai original enlightenment thinking develops. And the text that I'm going to introduce draws on all three of these models. So let's turn to this uh, contemplation of suchness, the Shinyokan. Uh, this work is attributed to the Tendai master Genshin, but it actually uh, dates considerably later, to around the 12th century. The word Shinyo translates tatata, or suchness, and is used in this work as a synonym for Buddha nature, original enlightenment, and the Tendai threefold truth. The Shinyokan belongs to an early phase of original enlightenment discourse and illustrates Hongaku ideas as they were just starting to take shape. Some extant versions of the texts are written in vernacular Japanese rather than the uh, literary Chinese customarily employed for Buddhist writing. And certain passages suggest perhaps an educated lay readership. Um, let's first begin with the basic argument. The opening passage reads in part, if you wish to attain Buddhahood quickly, you must think my own mind is precisely the principle of suchness. If you think that suchness which pervades the Dharma realm is your own essence, you are at once the Dharma realm. Do not think there is anything apart from this. When one is awakened, the Buddhas in the worlds of the 10 directions and also all bodhisattvas dwell within oneself. To seek a separate Buddha apart from one's own person is the action of a time when one does, one does not know that oneself is precisely suchness. So the essential practice uh, recommended here is to continually generate the thought that oneself is suchness. Uh, according to the text, this attitude may be cultivated in uh, connection with other practices, such as sutra copying or recitation or chanting the Buddha's name, or as a practice in its own right. But in any case, one should arouse this thought amidst all daily activities, walking, sitting, standing, or lying down. Being simple to practice, the contemplation of suchness is touted as suitable for everyone. Clergy or laity, male or female, all should contemplate in this way. One should contemplate not only oneself as suchness, but also others. Uh, other human beings, of course, but also animals, down to the tiniest ants and crickets, and insentient beings as well. Because grasses and trees, mountains and rivers, the vast sea and the empty sky are all suchness, there is none that is not Buddha. Um, so according to the Shinyokan, because suchness is the real aspect of all things, to regard both oneself and others in this way is to access a dimension in which individuals are not separate 
unrelated or conflicting existences, but non-dual, each pervading the totality of all that is and encompassing all others within itself. It is, in other words, to see all beings as manifesting original enlightenment, just as they are. The text then makes two major claims. The first is that this single practice contains the merit of all practices. Uh, for example, when one offers a single flower or lights one stick of incense uh, before a single Buddha, because that single flower or stick of incense is precisely suchness, it pervades the Dharma realm. And because the single Buddha to whom it is offered also is precisely suchness, that one Buddha is all Buddhas, and the countless Buddhas of the ten directions without exception all at once receive that offering. And this principle is said to hold true not only for specifically re religious acts, but uh, mundane activities for, uh, uh, as well. So here we get this suggestion maybe of, of a lay readership. When you provide for your wife, children and retainers, or even feed oxen, horses, and other domestic animals, if you think these others are precisely suchness, you have in effect made offerings to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Ten Directions and to all living beings without a single exception. Thus, this single thought, this is suchness, produced with respect to whatever comes within one's field of consciousness, transforms the action of that moment into Buddhist practice and contains infinite merit that refracts boundlessly throughout the cosmos. A second major claim is that contemplating suchness overrides defilements and karmic obstructions. Uh, so here we have a passage. From today on, knowing that your own mind is itself suchness, you will not be hindered by evil karma or defilements. Fame and profit will instead become nourishment for enlightened wisdom. Even if you should violate the precepts without shame or be negligent and idle in religious observances, so long as you always contemplate suchness and never forget to do so, you should never think that evil karma or defilements will obstruct your realization of Buddhahood. Um, actually, I think that to uh, always contemplate suchness and never forget to do so, simple but not easy. Um, anyway, the claim here is that one does not eradicate defilements uh, because defilements and enlightenment are non-dual. Uh, rather, in the contemplation of suchness, defilements are, are somehow naturally redirected in a soteriological, soteriologically efficacious way, a liberative way. Uh, passages like these have understandably drawn uh, criticisms that Hongaku doctrine is ethically problematic. Uh, we can imagine, however, that efforts to always contemplate everything as suchness and never forget to do so uh, might do much to obviate evil actions. The Shin Yokan, in fact, suggests as much in a subsequent discussion of the single error that will block liberation and perpetuate samsara. That error is to regard oneself as a limited, separate existence whose interests are opposed to those of others. Failing to regard that ourselves and others are equally suchness, we arbitrarily regard as self what is not really the self, arousing anger toward those who oppose us and possessive attachment to, toward those who affirm us, and thus continue to undergo deluded rebirth. Uh, moreover, we read, because suchness is the essence of all Buddhas, one who disbelieves that everything is suchness slanders all Buddhas throughout time and space. The Shinyokan seeks to discourage this unwholesome attitude with an overview of karmic retribution in the lower rebirth realms. First, it rehearses the sufferings in the eight major hells. But it dwells kind of idiosyncratically uh, on the animal realm, and especially on small insects, inviting the reader to contemplate the plight of crickets, ants, and even the countless invisibly tiny creatures that inhabit each of our 84,000 pores. When, it asks, will beings like these achieve liberation? 
Birth in such a small body, the Shinyokan asserts, is the fruit of attachment to a narrow concept of self. But in the act of contemplating oneself and others as equally identical to suchness, one returns to the reality of original enlightenment and one's body and mind at once fill the Dharma realm. The suggestion here is that failure to perceive suchness, the mutual encompassing of all things, ultimately will contract the self into a small constricted form, while contemplation of suchness opens one's person to become coextensive with everything else. Uh, realizing that self and others are not essentially different, one no longer gives rise to the egocentric impulses that perpetuate samsaric suffering. Now, uh, let's turn to the status of practice as represented in this text and take a look at this passage. When you eat, if you carry out this contemplation of suchness, the merit of the perfection of giving at once fills the Dharma realm. And because one practice is equivalent to all practices, the single practice of the perfection of giving contains the other paramitas. And because cause and effect are non-dual, all practices, which represent the causal stage, are simultaneously the myriad virtues of the stage of realization. Thus, you are a bodhisattva of the highest stage, a tathagata of perfect enlightenment. So when we break for lunch, you might want to remember this. Um, here we see uh, a third major claim that in contemplating suchness, the myriad virtues of complete enlightenment are immediately accessed in the practice of the present moment. Now, according to the Shinyokan, this extraordinary idea that the totality of the Buddha's supreme awakening can be realized in a single moment's practice is unique to the Lotus Sutra, which was revered in the Tendai school as the Buddha's highest teaching. Other provisional teachings are said to represent the inferior perspective of acquired enlightenment, in which to reach awakening, one must first eradicate defilements and accumulate merit and so forth. So the uh, Shinyokan uh, tells us that um, according to uh, sutras uh, other than the Lotus Sutra, provisional teachings, bodhisattvas of those provisional teachings Ignorant of the contemplation of suchness, for countless kalpas carried out difficult and painful practices, not begrudging bodily life, and thus attained Buddhahood. But it was not real Buddhahood, only a provisional fruit achieved in a dream. Those who know the contemplation of suchness become Buddhas in an instant. So here we have a denial of Buddhahood as a future goal, the culmination of a linear process of cultivation and attainment. Instead, we might call this a mandalic idea of Buddhahood as always and fully accessible in the present. And this is, this is really quite a legitimating move going on in this passage here. Uh, you notice that it rejects the model of practice established by Shakyamuni Buddha himself. <laughs> Uh, who is said to have achieved Buddhahood only after countless kalpas of austere disciplines. In the words of the Lotus Sutra itself, there is no place in the trichiliocosm, not even the size of a mustard seed, where the bodhisattva did not cast away bodily life for the sake of living beings. But medieval Japanese Tendai exegetes found room in the Lotus Sutra to question this conventional linear model of practice and attainment. And in chapter 16 of the Lotus Sutra, that's in Kumara Jiva's uh, Chinese translation, um, Shakyamuni Buddha reveals that he had not, as everyone thought, achieved enlightenment for the first time in this life under the Bodhi tree. Rather, he has been the Buddha since the inconceivably remote past. His departure from his father's palace, his practice of asceticism, his search for the way, and even his entry into final nirvana were all his skillful means, a pedagogical device. In fact, he declares, I am always here, preaching the Dharma. 
So there are many ways that that sentence has been, uh, that passage has been read in, in the history of Lotus Sutra interpretation. Uh, but for medieval Japanese Tennai thinkers, uh, they took this revelation of the Buddha's primordial awakening as a metaphor for the originally enlightened status of all beings, an enlightenment to be fully accessed in the moment of practice without traversing successive stages. One might, in fact, understand medieval Japanese hongaku thought as an effort to rethink the entire received Tendai tradition from that perspective. Now, at this point, the text uh, posits a, a common sense objection. I don't understand how we can all be Buddhas without distinction. A Buddha is one who possesses the 32 marks. This, this is like Shinran's objection that Professor Kumagai told us uh, about yesterday. Uh, someone whose supernatural powers and wisdom surpass those of all others. Um, you know, I'll skip part of this. Even if you call yourself a Buddha, you do not possess the 32 features, nor have you gained supernatural powers. Arousing surpassing arrogance, you call it the Buddha wisdom, a boundlessly grave sin. How do you respond? So um, on the one hand, this seems like a, a naive question, uh, confusing an ontological equality of the Buddha and all beings with the uh, liberative realization of Buddhahood itself. Uh, but it also serves, it's a setup, it serves to introduce a new understanding of what Buddha is, seen from a Hongaku perspective. And the Shinyokan responds with a, a new, a reinterpretation of the six stages of identity. This is a traditional Tiantai Marga scheme, a model of the path. It goes back to the uh, sixth century Chinese patriarch uh, Juri, long before the uh, emergence of original enlightenment thought. Uh, I won't go through the whole thing, but uh, the first stage, identity and principle, is the stage of a deluded person who has not yet heard the Buddha's teachings but nonetheless, in principle, is equal to a Buddha. And the second stage, called verbal identity, or myoji soku, uh, this denotes the initial stage of practice, at which one encounters a teacher or a scripture and understands at a verbal or a conceptual level that all dharmas are the Buddha dharma. You know, one, one intellectually understands non-duality and gives one's assent. Uh, then there are four subsequent stages of cultivation, uh, eventually culminating, probably some lifetimes hence, in perfect Buddhahood. And this word identity in the name of each stage is a reminder that whatever one's level of attainment lower high, ontologically, one is no different from the Buddha. There's an equality there. Now, according to the Shinyokan, if we were to define or um, categorize the contemplation of suchness in terms of this traditional model of the path, it would cor correspond to stage two, that of verbal identity. And this is, is important, actually. I mean, if the original Enlightenment doctrine said that you don't need to practice, then it would be stage one. It doesn't say that. Stage, one, stage two is the contemplation of suchness. Now, this stage two, that of verbal identity, is conventionally understood as the very beginning stage of practice. But for this text and for original enlightenment discourse in general, it becomes the only stage that matters. At this stage, the Shinyokan says, we have already heard the name of the threefold truth and understood that we ourselves are precisely suchness. The distinguishing physical marks and supernatural powers belong to the later stages. But it would be the height of foolishness, the texts insist, to regard those as defining characteristics of Buddhahood. Wheel-turning kings, after all, have the 32 marks, and non-Buddhists may possess supernatural powers. The real Buddha is suchness, and those who contemplate suchness are at once the Buddha of original enlightenment. Their every action is the mudra of suchness, their every utterance is a mantra, and their every thought is esoteric contemplation. In short, the entire path 
reduces to the move from stage one to stage two. And between those two lies the entire difference between liberation and bondage, between knowing that all things are suchness or not knowing it. Now, somewhat later Hongaku texts explicitly collapse all the later stages into that of verbal identity, the initial stage of practice, so that the path turns back on itself and the end is present in the beginning. We could say that the uh, original Enlightenment discourse is committed to asserting an absolute temporal non-duality, undercutting the idea of practice as a graded progression toward a future goal. Any notion of Buddhahood achieved as the end result of cultivation over time, the position of acquired enlightenment, is dismissed, either as an inferior provisional view or as an outright error. Now, Hongaku doctrine, as I mentioned, does not deny the need for practice, uh, although uh, it has often been represented that way in scholarship for reasons that I, I don't have time to get into. Uh, rather, practice is no longer instrumentalized. It is not a means to enlightenment, but inseparable from it. Of course, we experience time in a linear way. And the Shinyokan acknowledges that due to individual differences in human capacity, not everyone will readily be able to sustain the insight that all things are suchness. Most of us, uh, beings with dull faculties, uh, may think in this moment, I am suchness. But at the next moment, easily give way to greed, anger, and so forth in reaction to external circumstances. So this is something that can be gained, lost, regained. Uh, that is why continuous contemplation of suchness in all activities is stressed, uh, even, we read, while lying down with one's sash untied. So, uh, depending upon one's faculties, one might need a day, two days, a month, two months, a year, or even a lifetime to solidify this contemplation. But Anyone can do so with this present body. Uh, crucially, this development, this solidification of the contemplation of suchness is represented not as progress toward an external goal, something out there in the future, but as a deepening of an enlightenment one already has. So uh, in concluding, uh, we could say that this uh, work, the Shinyokan, illustrates two broad features of original enlightenment thinking. First is an inversion in the relation of practice and enlightenment. Enlightenment is no longer the goal of practice, but its foundation. Practice is not a means to enlightenment, but its paradigmatic expression. And um, some other uh, slightly later uh, texts in a Hongaku vein speak of this as a reversal. One abandons the perspective, the perspective of proceeding from cause to effect, that is from practice to enlightenment, and adopts the perspective of moving from effect to cause, that is from enlightenment to practice. Uh, some scholars have termed this a Copernican revolution within Buddhism. Uh, in, in any event, was, one does not traverse stages. Because enlightenment is originally inherent and accessed fully in the present moment, it does not depend on accumulating merit or eradicating defilements. There is cultivation, but cultivation means deepening one's awareness of a Buddhahood always and already present. Second, the concept of Buddhahood itself changes. The Shinyokan's claim that the real Buddha is suchness leads to what we might call an anti-transcendent move. Uh, in this discourse, Buddhahood finds expression not in supernatural powers or extraordinary signs, but in daily activities. It is immediately accessible without extirpating delusion. This perspective is touted as far superior to the idea of Buddhahood as an ideal state 
cultivated over campus. But one trades for this accessibility, the ideal of someday becoming a perfected being. <coughs> Rather, one manifests Buddhahood while remaining an ordinary, deluded worldling. Uh, later texts in a Hongaku mode would further develop this idea, asserting that the Buddha of original enlightenment has transcended august Marx and belongs to the mundane world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this very fascinating account. And there's a first question already. Thank you so much. It's very fascinating. And also, I see a lot of uh, parallel ideas that I'm in the process that I study. And uh, my question would be, um, has there any, any sort of an attempt, either on the part of traditional scholars or non-scholars, who try to find traces of such concepts or ideas or sociological models in the Indian sources? This would be one question. The second question is, uh, the idea that, uh, I don't know if here or the Uttak Jana is already like, this is very reminiscent of, of uh, the Dzogchen idea that, um, that the seven beings are actually princes, but uh, wandering around as beggars. <laughs> so it's just a matter of recognizing whether one, one is a prince or not, but even as he wanders as a, as a beggar, he has never changed his princely status. And so this is very kind of somewhat, uh, I find some similarity. So these, uh, these are the two. Thank you. I am, I'm so happy to hear this comment. Um, I should give you a little bit of um, background. Uh, the notion of original enlightenment was discovered by scholarship, uh, so to speak, in the early 20th century. And this is, uh, of course, the time when Japan is, is modernizing and trying to compete with the West. And intellectuals need to answer the criticism that Japan has religion but no philosophy. And so they, they find in this, well, here is our philosophy. And so there's been a tendency ever since to look at this as something that's distinctively or even uniquely Japanese, which for me raises a red flag. Um, and so I don't know, there, there have been a few attempts to uh, find parallels, uh, for example, in certain forms of Chinese Chan, um, but I think there needs to be a lot more work done on, on finding what are the continuities on the Asian continent, uh, both in Indian and Tibetan uh, materials. Uh, with the Tibetan material in particular, I mean, Tibet and Japan are both cultures where um, Buddhism has been, has a tremendously strong esoteric tantric influence. And uh, I really hope that next generation of scholars will do more to compare those two. They're, they're, it's what has been done thus far is, is not adequate by any means. And the Dzogchen um, reminded me, I, I heard of Dzogchen first from uh, Brian Cuevas, who I think um, some of you know. And it struck me, oh, this sounds really familiar. Um, so I think that you may be right. Uh, I myself am not don't have the expertise, but I, this is an open field for future research, so I hope somebody will look into this. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thanks very much. That was extremely interesting. The text you discussed, does that also give you um, concrete um, ideas how to practice, how to uh, focus on this suchness? You know, it's, it's really interesting. I chose this text for this conference because um, it, it spells things out a lot more than uh, many of, of the texts dealing with this concept. Uh, I don't really, I mean, one, one problem we have is that this material comes down, it begins as oral transmissions, then these are, are recorded on strips of paper, and then they're collected, and they sort of become the lineage possession of, of monasteries, and they're, they're passed down in, in a monastic world. And it's very, very difficult to get a sense of what century specific texts are written in. This one you can pin down to an actual century. It's amazing. Um, who wrote them? They tend to be attributed to great masters of the past who we know didn't write them. And most importantly, what, what role did they play in the overall religious life of individuals? Very, very hard to get at. I doubt that this doctrine structured the entire religious practice of very many people. Um, so this text actually tells us more about specific practice than many. 
And uh, so no, we don't, um, for this, you, where, where you find specific instructions is, you know, something like Pure Land, where there's, there's a lot more, you know, how to, or, or Chan, you know, how to, how to sit, how to think, how to focus the mind. So here, I think we would have to read more widely in um, Tendai, 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 uh, debate, uh, uh, meditation instruction and, and so forth. Um, but there is this focus on, on the single moment. Sounds like yeah. a modern mindfulness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in, in a way, except, uh, yeah, in a way, yes. Yeah, sort of building on that question, how does this look in an institutional setting? I mean, is this sort of, you can envision uh, everyone just wandering the fields, feeding their oxen, and, uh, you know, contemplating suchness, but what, what are the monasteries, uh, how do they deal with this? You know, it's, it's really interesting, like I said, these are, uh, tend to be um, handed down as secret transmissions. Even this writing looks like originally it was a bunch of separate transmissions that were compiled. Um, so uh, it takes place, it, it, it's part of debate training, it's part of doctrinal training, it's part of lineage definition, mm -hmm. and there's always a presumption of secrecy. You know, you are originally Buddha, shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, and, and of course, uh, everybody knows, it's obvious that there, there's a lot of cross-fertilization across different, different lineages and, and so forth. Uh, we do know uh, this is a doctrine that uh, has a, an immense impact on Japanese literature uh, on the formation of what we call medieval Shinto. So it, it's definitely spilling out of the monastic institution. We can find it in poetry, popular songs. Uh, so we know that there is a broader impact, um, but trying to isolate the, the cultural surround is, is very difficult. I suspect that it was one mode of Buddhist study you know, in a monastery, um, you know, with some exceptions, it was, it was very common that people would study different traditions, even if their own practice focused on, on one or, or two or whatever, and so that this would be part, one, one perspective um, on the religious life. Oh, when it came time to die, I think most people hoped for birth in the pure land. <laughs> <laughs> the deluded part sounds very provocative. So I'll start with that. What does, what, how can you say, I mean, Buddha has the sense of awakening from the delusion of, right, right. Um, this is quite provocative. Um, yeah, so you know these, these, these uh, models of the path where, you know, first you extirpate the, you know, um, this level of defilement and then the next level of defilement and first desires and then conceptual um, attachments and, and so forth. And so this is the idea, if you just cut through this, it's direct. And there seems to be a claim for some sort of transformative experience. You know, like in, in this text, you know, like not knowing that you are suchness is, is bondage, you're gonna continue to be reborn probably in lesser and lesser forms. If you know it, that's, that's Buddhahood. You, you realize some sort of, you know, um, uh, identity or non-duality with everything there is. So there, there does seem to be a, a tacit claim for a, a transformation, not only a, of consciousness, but one's way of being in the world that is, is never fully articulated. But it's, it's definitely something, um, you know, the, the ideology is, it's, it's in the moment. It's, it's posited against the idea of this is a distant goal that we get to gradually. Of course, if that idea were not there, this argument would lose its force. Yeah. So it's, it's parasitic upon it. No, I just it. Yeah. That moment of um, transformation or transcendence that you shed the delusion. Because often in they don't want to say that. They really don't want to say that. They, really they, to say that. Too, they say sentient beings are no different than Buddhas except for the fact that they don't realize they're, you know, that type of idea. Yeah, this goes a little further. Yeah, you know, yeah. it wants to say we attain Buddhahood as a deluded person. <laughs> you know, the, the marks of the Buddha of original enlightenment is, uh, you know, wearing an extra robe in the winter and using fans in the summer. You know, completely <laughs> daily life sort of things. You know. Yeah. Sustain the Pala Vajrayana, the goal sustained Vajra vehicles of 
there is this whole discourse about in how about your anime, you you're taking the goal as the top, so there's no linear um, progression from a starting point to top to a goal. And it, it gets taken up in Dokchen in an interesting way because they talk about the Godu go uh, go Lam and the Godu Mete Lam. The Godu Lam means the path that you travel. The Godu Mete Lam is the path where there's no traveling. <laughs> and um, the Godu Mete Lam is <coughs> considered to be Ati Yoga Dokchen. It's um, soul made, no effort. The eight vehicles leading up to that are the Godu Lam, and they're called the the uh, paths of the mind, of the ordinary um, mind, whereas the Yoga Mete Lam is the path of wisdom. So that sounds very much like this idea that um, you have kind of a, a model of the path that's very much the product of the mind trying to chart out a progression in terms of you know stages and so on, and then you have this model where there's no more stages, no more paths. That's really, really interesting. I mean, the, uh, there, there is an overall uh, move within Japanese Buddhism of, of which original enlightenment, I think, is part to, to bring it closer to home, as it were. And the idea that the ontological equality ought to make for immediate access. And, um, but this is really interesting to, to hear about the parallels. And I, I hope somebody, I, I don't have the expertise, but I hope somebody will do that kind of work in the future. Of uh, um, you cited the Shin Yokan, so we don't know who knows the contemplation of substance to become a good person in an instant. Uh huh. Uh, is this the position of Shin Yokan? Of whom? The uh, uh, position uh, of the game, uh, it's, it's not a uh, combo by the nation, but uh, yeah, is it the position of the order of Shin Yokan or uh, other, other positions? I'm sorry, man, the order of whom? Right. The contemplation of suchness become Buddhist in Kingston. Is this the position, idea of the order of Shin Yokan? Author, author. Oh, of of the author, yeah, yeah. Who is not Genshin? So. Yeah. Yeah. So his position. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not mine. His. Right, right. In that case, uh, it seems to be a kind of a, a well, it's, it's really interesting. I, th I think you're, it, it's, an, it's a valuable observation. Yes. Um, um, Kumagai Sensei is, is saying that since there's a distinction between those who believe in, in suchness, that they are suchness, and those who don't, it sounds like there's still an element of acquired enlightenment. And you can't get away from it. Because um, if we, uh, let me see, let me go see if I can get back here. Um, if, if not, then, then, then uh, you know, you're, you're at the first stage here. And there is no difference, there would be no difference between a completely deluded person and a Buddha, and, the pers and there would be no meaning to the religious life. Right? So uh, this is a discourse that wants to, wants to make it as, me as immediate as possible. But ultimately, we're left with the distinction between samsara and nirvana. And so I, I think that even the, the claim for original enlightenment, um, it, it has its force because there is a separation there yeah. that, that is irreducible. Otherwise, there's no point to practice, right? Thank you. Okay, one more last question, please. When, uh, in this tradition, mm -hmm. it is said that uh, the inanimate universe is Buddha. What do they mean? Ah, that is a really good question, um, and it's been much disputed. Uh, that is something that starts a little earlier than, than uh, original Enlightenment thought. Um, there's a very strong claim in the Japanese Buddhist tradition. It, it's called the Buddhahood of plants and trees is the, the, the technical term. Um, some scholars tell us that this has to do with a Japanese innate love of nature. Um, I, I, you know, don't quite, not quite convinced by that. Um, other people say that it's uh, an attempt to extend the boundaries 
of the Buddhist compassion as far as it will go. And that there, there shouldn't be exceptions. Everything is included. Um, there are a number of texts that deal with this, and it's not a unified discourse. Um, one of the most fascinating ones uh, attributed to um, Ryogen in the 10th century, not, not written by him, again, considerably later. But it says, if you look at plants, you know, they, uh, they sit there in meditation perpetually. <laughs> and um, so they sprout, and that's the arousing of the bodhicitta. And then they grow, that's cultivation. That, and then they flower, that's the realization of Buddhahood. And then they die back, that's entry into nirvana. So it, it's like, um, you know. That's a kind of, uh, that's a kind of poetic metaphor. It, yeah, it's a poetic metaphor. Um, so I don't, you know, it's, it's a question I can't answer. I don't know what it means. It's in, it's but it's. The Tibetan tradition, as far as I understand, yeah. it's, um, it's practically self evident that uh, something without a mind is incapable of accomplishing the path. That that's, that's the counter argument. Um, within the, the Japanese tradition, you know, there, there definitely, we see it's, it's used uh, rhetorically in the sense that uh, the claim that Buddhahood is extended to insentient life uh, shows a superior inclusivity. But it could be also in the sense that uh, phenomena are kind of pervaded by emptiness or once they are the mind's projection well, it's, it's interesting because you know that we find this in Chinese Buddhism, well, not to the extent, same extent. So, with uh, with the in the Chinese case, because um, the uh, the subject and object, you know, the, the the individual and the container world are, are non-dual. When the individual attains Buddhahood, so does the environment, and so the enlightened person dwells in the Buddha land, whereas someone who is suffering dwells in hell, even though they may be occupying the same space. Um, but uh, then the Japanese exegetes want to say that they're going beyond that. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Again. Thank you very much.